Hence, um, jazz. There I go, there I go, there I go. Pretty baby, you are the soul that sets my control. <laughs> bugs and loaded bellas if you have not already done so please remember to like share that means tell a friend and or share to twitter facebook whatever subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com for these super fly shades in black and or beige okay yeah love these these are too cool for me and this chuggy lip and if you are not already a part of this book club please hit the patreon link below and door the join button here on the youtube and for a small monthly fee of five dollars you babies yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before you digging them mm. Strike a pose. And you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Smokey the Robinson. Ronnie White's brother, Gerald, had a friend, said he was real musical, called him amazing, bugged Ronnie about him until Ronnie heard him, bugged me until I heard him. Bug Barry until Barry heard him. Finally, we all heard him. We dug him and started calling him Baby Ray because he was like a little Ray Charles. He was a blind whiz kid named Steveland Morris. But Barry, after signing him and finding him tutors, called him Little Stevie Wonder. He was 10, hyper, bright, brimming with talent. Smokey Robinson really does find a way to evade uh saying things as they are but still saying things as they are he said hyper murray well said handsy that little mother hunchy couldn't keep his hands off of me mm -hmm. i knew that i knew that about the little steveland he was 10 hyper bright brimming with talent he needed lots of work but he was willing. He leaped around the studio like a frog, beating the drums, blowing the harmonica, eating up sounds like they were candy. Within two years, he had a big record called Fingertips. His growth, like Motown's, could hardly be contained. Later, his philosophical chatter could be a little long-winded, but I never stopped loving him. Our musical paths would soon meet complicating my life in ways both wonderful and worrisome but it sounds like Smokey robinson is just saying in a good way that nigga got on my nerves but the finished project was always amazing i need a hit Smokey. everyone around here has hits except us diane was still impatient still anxious to see some chart action for the supremes when it happens i told her it'll be like a bolt of lightning are you sure, Smokey? I'm not sure of anything, baby, except that the sun's going to set and the tax man's going to call. Word. What can I be doing that I'm not doing to push us? I didn't slept with you, Smokey. Why haven't you gotten me a record? We we sleeping together. Well, we was until the Claudette put a stop to it. But why, why, what, 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 what? You're pushing, honey. I've never seen anyone push so hard. I'd say you're doing fine. But the hit, I've got to have a hit. Later that year, I'll try something new, sung by the Miracles Hit Big. The Supreme still hadn't made it, but our career was going great guns. And better yet, Claudette became pregnant again. This time we were sure there'd be no mishaps. This time we just had to make it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. By 1963, the pot was boiling. By 1964, it had boiled over. By 1965, we were scorching. And from then on, things only got hotter. Motown ran on creative juices. Most record companies were headed by cats who were primarily businessmen. But because Barry was a songwriter and producer, because his heart was more excited by music 
than balance sheets. The song, the hit song, was an obsession that filled our nights and days. We dreamed it, we pursued it, we did it. In fact, for a period of time, we did it bigger than anybody before or since. We did it in this little building, this little old house called Hitsville. There were warnings when the money started coming in. Barry called us together and put it plainly. Look, he said, y'all are getting some hefty checks now. But remember, the bread is not all yours. A big chunk belongs to Uncle Sam. Eventually, Sam's going to get his. So you better put his aside right now. If you don't do it now, you'll lose it later. Of all the people in the room, writers, producers, and artists, I may have been the only one who listened. Barry was far from perfect. He made mistakes about singers and songs. Sometimes the pressure got to him. He could go off. He could be moody. And later, he didn't always hire the right executives. But his goals were clear. His values solid. In the beginning, for instance, he sent his artist to school. Fact is, he created a school, called it Artist Development, and hired Harvey Fuqua to run the thing. All the teachers were steeped in knowledge and strict as hell. Vocal coach Maurice King was an exacting taskmaster. The great choreographer Charlie Atkins turned us into dancers. Maxine Powell taught us fundamental social graces, giving us the confidence to walk into any situation with our heads high. Quality people were all around me. Walking into the rehearsal hall, I ran into Lamont Dozier, sitting at the piano, playing with a Bo Diddley derived dance ditty. Hey man, I said, what's that? Not sure. He noodled some more and the shiz sounded even better. That's a new song, Lamont? Not sure. I was sure liking it though. Got any words? Only these. He started humming. Lum de lum de la. Let me try. I said, imitating his scat licks. I like it, Lamont. Man, I like it a lot. The Miracles cut it. Lamont and Brian Holland produced it. And Mickey's monkey climbed onto the top of the tree, creating a full-fledged dance craze while becoming a big hit in 1963. There are a few reasons why I have a vast knowledge of different genres of music. Much of it being way before my time. Most of it being way before my time. Yes, I enjoyed the 80s music, the 90s music, the 2000 music. I did. Right about now, I don't know what the hell is going on with music because I listen more to the streaming through my phone than I do the radio. So I really don't know. Now, I watch the Instagrammy or the Tiki Talkie, and if I like a, a rap song, then I'll download that. But other than that, I really don't know what's happening with music right now. I know a lot of music because of my grandmother, my Aunt Crystal, my mother, and my stepfather, okay? I also know a lot of music because of the music genre Go-Go. My favorite group when I was 15 years old was Rare Essence. And they were much older than me. I mean, not much, but I would say at least 10 years older than me. And most of them were musically trained at Duke Ellington. And they would introduce us to music. Hence, um, jazz. There I go, there I go, there I go. Pretty baby, you are the soul that sets my control. So not because of Rare Essence, but because of Chuck Brown. And I knew about Mickey's Monkey because of Rare Essence. Rare Essence, hold on guys. I'm gonna have to turn my AC on because my computer's getting hot. Rare Essence had a song called Go Go Mickey. That was just a revised version of Mickey's Monkey. And Mickey was the Congo player for Rare Essence.
listening to a tape of the song Go Go Mickey. My mama said, wait a minute. That's not Go Go Mickey. That's Mickey's Monkey by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. I said, who the hell? She was like, oh, baby, you know him. You sing the song, ooh, baby, all the time. Okay, I'm that, what? In 1963, Pete's Army stint was up. I wasn't drafted because of respiratory problems and a mastodectomy, which according to the army doctors had left a hole in my head, a draining opening that never closed. The miracles were back at full strength. Claudette, however, worked less and less. Like the first time her water broke in the fifth month. Our hearts broke so badly that for days we just sat in the house holding hands, praying for peace of mind. I told you before and I'll tell you again, Marv Toplin is a monster musician. He's inspired me all my life. And especially in these formative years, he kicked my ass, coming up with music just begging for words. On the frets on his guitar, he gave birth to a slew of smash songs. Subtly was Marv's hallmark. The tasty riff, the slight suggestion, the soulful turn of phrase. With just a few notes, Marv could whip up an emotional hurricane. The first track he gave me haunted me for months before I found words to fit the music. Slowly, I fleshed out the verses. I was dealing with a sad story, a cat who'd been cut deep, hurt by heartache. I knew my man was suffering strong. What I lacked, though, was a chorus. One day, I was working with Pete Moore when the picture finally focused. I saw a guy who'd cried so much until it looked like tears had walked over his face. The tracks of my tears. I thought to myself, I had the song. That happened on a Friday. I worked all weekend on a demo tape. And the following Monday morning, I showed up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for the weekly meeting with all the other writers and producers. You'd look around the big table and see the Motown brain trust. General Gordy at the helm surrounded by his lieutenants, Harvey Fuqua, Johnny Bristol, Mickey Stevenson, Brian Holland, Lamont Dozier, Eddie Holland, Clarence Paul, that's Stevie's main man, yeah, until the Burry Gordy shitted on him, until Burry Gordy picked up Hitsville, Motown, whatever, and moved it to California to make movies. And Burry Gordy's cutthroat sentiment was, either you come with us to California or you stay here in Detroit and die. Because you know them Detroit riots had him real jittery, okay? And Burry Gordy was like, F all this. Detroit ain't where it's happening. I'm moving me, my main girl, Diana, over to the California. And Clarence Paul, I know you wrote me a couple of hits for Steveland. But baby, I mean, either you gonna come or you gonna, you know, die. Sink or swim, buddy. Uh, Clarence Paul, Stevie's main man, and a little later, the formidable Norman Whitfield. None of these guys were pushovers. Who's got something for the Supremes, Burry would ask. He built a meeting around the artist. Anyone with a song for the Supremes, for example, would play it. Sometimes we'd all agree on what seemed an obvious hit, but mostly revisions would be suggested and mostly they'd be heeded. When we got to the miracles that morning, I proudly played my tape of Tracks of My Tears. You crazy, Barry asked when I was through. No, why? You got a hit, but you buried your hook. Bring it up at the end, man. Repeat that shiz. That it's easy to trace the tracks of my tears. Refrain until you wear it out. The song wore well. It was a miracles hit in the mid-60s. A Linda Rodstad hit in the mid-70s. And in the mid-80s, a hit in the movie Platoon. The movie meant the most. It gave me special joy to know that in some small way our tune comforted guys 
risking their lives for a cause most of us still didn't understand. Let me go back, okay. So now I understand why Linda Ronstadt was there at the Motown 25, okay, okay, girl. You know, it was like they forced the white people on us in the Motown 25, hence the adamant, okay, and the Linda Ronstadt. But, you know, I ain't mad at Linda because I like her. But let me move forward to the movie Platoon to see how the the Vietnam soldiers were just singing together. Tracks of My Tears, man, that thing is beautiful. To find a sense of peace in the moment. I don't understand, Smoke, Marvin Gaye was saying. I had one hit, but it wasn't what I expected. I still want to sing those standards. It was the middle of March and we were playing catch on the lawn in front of the Hitsfield building. Thank you. 